So welcome everybody tonight. Uh, my name is Richard um, and I am uh, I work at Edendale Farm um, in, in um, Nillenbeck Council. I'd also I'd like to, um, um, to um, introduce um, Dominic Bald, who is from Melbourne Water and John um, Gooderham, who's going to be our speaker tonight on um, water bugs. Now, before we do start, I'd like to do a, a, an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we are on um, in tonight on this, on this um, um, webinar. So we all may be in different um, countries at this point in time, being a virtual online session, but I'm in the lands of the uh, traditional owners and, and custodians of the Wurundjeri people, which is also where Edendale is. Um, I'd also like to res uh, pay respects to the elders past, pre present and emerging and any other other elders from other communities that might be online tonight with us here. Now, this is a part of the, this is the final of four webinars, um, which was a part of the um, platypus celebration, which Melbourne Water and um, Nellenbeck Council have been putting on over the last um, eight or nine days. Um, so there we are going to be recordings available for, of the previous um, um, sessions as well, if you haven't seen those. So keep an eye out on your email and the website for that. Um, and tonight's topic is going to be looking at um, um, water bugs and the importance of water bugs as a barometer of the health of creeks, but also as a really important food source for all sorts of different animals within the creek systems, including the platypus. Now, um, just one thing, we, are, we still do have one big event that is was planned to be run on um, Sunday was the platypus um, celebration at Edendale. Um, it's looking very likely at this stage that that is going to be postponed until later in the year, probably at winter, just due to the, um, the COVID uh, concerns that are going around at the moment. So that is still got to be 100% confirmed yet, um, <coughs> but it's more than likely that we'll be um, deferring that until later of the year. Um, but it's also really important that, to recognise that both Melbourne Water and um, Nellamby Council are really committed to helping protect the Diamond Creek and also the, all of the types of biodiversity that live within the Diamond Creek, including the platypus. Um, and so that's what tonight's webinar is about, um, is, which is about the, the health of our systems, um, water systems, and a little bit of information about um, um, water bugs. So, just very briefly before I pass you over to John, I'll just do a really quick introduction about John. Um, so John is a freshwater ecologist and he works at the National Water uh, with the National Waterbug Blitz. He's co-authored a book called The Waterbug Book with um, Edward um, Shivlin, I think it is, and The Waterbug App uh, with Michael Sharman, um, which is an app that's available both on Apple and Android. He's currently making um, short waterbug documentaries and helping people set up citizen science projects to monitor rivers and wetlands around Australia using waterbugs. So thank you very much everyone for attending tonight and I'm just going to pass you straight over to John who can take us through uh, for the rest of the evening. Thanks Richard. Um, I'll do some screen wrestling and see if I can pop my show on. Here we go. How's that? Looks good. It's not me, it's um, a, a screen. I, I apologize for this being a PowerPoint presentation, but the, your options were fairly limited. They were either the PowerPoint with interesting bugs in it, or just me standing in an office waving my arms and possibly doing bug imitations, which, you know, has its appeal under certain sort of circumstances, um, but, you know, doesn't really fill an hour and isn't actually as informative as it sounds. Um, the thing I sort of normally talk about tends to just be water bugs. So I, I'm being stretched a little bit outside of my comfort zone here. So if I make any factual errors, um, feel free to rub my nose in them at the end in question time. Um, we'll also use question time at the end, I guess, to if there's stuff that I've not made clear enough or if it brings up stuff that you've been thinking about and you'd, you'd like a, a uh, like an answer on, on anything sort of water bug related, um, bombard me with those. Probably as you think of them is the way to go in the chat. And then um, we'll mop them all up at the end if that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that way uh, you can get it out of your head when you think of it. And um, we'll, we'll do our dernest to um, get back to it um, at the end of the session. Um, Richard, that audio is okay if I just uh, soldier on regardless? Yep, sounds good. Awesome, cool. So um, I, being a Waterberg person, don't have that many good pictures of platypus. Um, so I've not only drawn them, I've animated my own um, platypus because they're, they're quite difficult to go and see. You have to get up um, either early in the morning or late in the evening as many of you probably know, from the various other bits and pieces of talk that you've had this in this series. Um, 
what I'm going to try and do, I guess, is to introduce you a little bit to their dominant food source. One of the cool linkages, I guess, that's un, unquestionable between platypus and waterbugs is that they do have a very solid linkage. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, just to give you a feel for the relative sizes of these animals, um, the fellows I like, um, the water bugs and what have you, are the, the sort of cluster of little things on the left there, and the platypus is on the right. And that's roughly the, the proportions that we're dealing with. So we're looking at an animal that is, is much larger than most of your average water bugs. And generally speaking, this is the form of their interaction. Um, one will eat the other. Um, there isn't a lot of, um, it, it just doesn't go the other way. There are very few, water, no water bugs that I can think of that eat platypus. It's a, a very much a, a one directional sort of relationship they have. Um, I have a colleague that uh, spends a lot of time uh, up to his middle um, at the dusk and dawn in a river around the corner from where I live in Hobart, a uh, rivulet called Hobart Rivulet. And um, <clears throat> he's caught on footage, uh, some awesome bits of uh sort of sequences, I guess, of, of platypus foraging. If you have a bit of a squiz at this, this is um, Pete Walsh's underwater footage using a GoPro of um, several of the little platypus in Hobart Rivulet foraging. One of the cool things about this bit of footage is you get a feel for the behavioral stuff that they do. These things are electro um, receptive, I guess. So they're looking for little sparks, I guess, in their peripheral of the water bugs as they kick off and try and get away. And you can see, if you look, in this footage, there's things getting out of dodge very, very quickly. Um, there's a, a mayfly thrashing around just top left of screen there. And quite a few of them have, um, you know, come off the rocks and are just legging it left, right and center to try and get away from this horribly destructive, probably evil machine of death, destruction and um, annihilation if you're a water bug. So these things are quite a, a force to be reckoned with if you're tiny. And you can see that one's had a bit of success and is having a bit of a chomp at the end of that. And one of the things that the platypus will do when they chomp down on a, a series of uh, water bugs is that they'll squish all the, the soft parts and then they'll throw all the slightly harder parts to what they call cheek pouches just on the sides of the animal's mouth and um, they'll grind those down sort of slowly over time. One of the cool things about the cheek pouch stuff is that if you uh, have a relevant permit and you go grabbing platypus, you can scrape the cheek pouches out and have a look at what it is that um, your platypus has been eating at these things. Um, at the end of this, I guess, if you're interested in that sort of footage and, and Peter's taken uh, thousands of hours, you don't have to watch all of it, but he's got some awesome highlights videos. And this link here uh, goes to the middle, that bit of footage was in the middle of a talk that Pete did um, that was just basically about the the uh, ecology of the platypus in Hobart Rivulet and the stuff that he's observed over time. So it, it's worth a look if you um, have an idle half an hour or so. Um, there's awesome bits of footage in there. He's, he's managed to get some really, really good stuff over time. Oh, there we go. Stop it, John. Be a professional. Um, so water bugs basically fill in. If you can think of um, eco riverine, riverine ecosystems as a, uh, you know, they, they possess a food web just like any other chunk of environment that you can think of. There's a savanna food web, there's jungle food webs, there's lake food webs, there's deep sea food webs, and rivers very, have their own food web as well. And they tend to be made up with, um, I guess, um, if you guys can see, uh, I'll zoom into various bits, but you can see most of the water bugs tend to be down this part of the, um, the, the, the food web, they, they, they get by on decomposing leaves, periphyte and that sort of stuff. And they um, also sort of, I guess, are represented by a number of uh, predators, which are this sort of chop, these sorts of critters, water bugs that eat other water bugs, I guess. But all in all, they're a beautifully diverse sort of set of critters. Um, and, and I guess that's one of the things I want to get across today is that um, when you talk about platypus food and stuff, it tends to, I think it's demeaning to water bugs, personally. Um, and, and what you're missing in that is, yes, they're, they're little bite-sized snacks that keep your platypus going, but they are also an amazingly diverse little ecosystem that has um, all sorts of little niches that it fills. And um, hopefully today with this talk, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a feel for what that diversity looks like. And it looks a little bit like this, I guess. In this slide, we've got all sorts of beasties. There, top left, there is a flatworm, probably one of the, the more base or simple organisms that you might get in a river. In the middle, uh, sorry, down the bottom left, we've got a couple of water mites. Um, they're 
sort of bizarre in very many ways. They're actually predatory when they're wandering around in the river like this, but they do go through a sort of a parasitic stage where they'll latch onto the armpit of a dragonfly. And, and while they're doing that, if the dragonfly happens to emerge, that's their um, ticket to um, new wetlands and new rivers. And that's how they disperse in the landscape, which is kind of handy because they don't actually have a, a stage where they have wings. So, you know, little bits of ecology like that are kind of cool and a, a little bit more um, complex and fascinating than I think you'd probably give them credit just eyeballing them while they're little red dots hooning around a plastic teaspoon when you're doing water watch. Um, other things in this screen down the bottom, in the middle, there's a back swimmer. That one's a robust back swimmer. And they um, do this thing where they'll, you know, clean up the water surface by grabbing stuff that's fallen in and is um, connected there, but they also attack one another and other things in the water column. But they tend to exist in, in slower flowing bits, wetlands, lakes, and the slower flowing parts of rivers. On the right at the bottom, just to give you a feel for how amazing maggots can be, maggots tend to have a, a or the diptera, the true flies, tend to have a bit of a bad um, PR department. And so when people say maggots, they tend to crunkle their faces up into these little um, disgusted looks. Um, there are at some absolutely amazing maggots in rivers. This is one we called, uh, gave the common name of the regal maggot because it is quite spectacular. And this turns into a big daddy long legs type thing, like with enormous legs, flies around um, uh, Eastern Victoria, Gippsland Way. Uh, top right is a stonefly, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And right in the middle is probably one of the more conspicuous water bugs that you'll come across. Um, and this is a damselfly. And the cool thing about damselflies, I guess, is that they're the sort of thing that you tend to see if you hang out near um, rivers, um, even if you don't want to. They're the sort of thing that's in your eyeball because they are, um, they're conspicuous. They're often brightly colored. This is a selection from tropical Australia slash Papua New Guinea. So that they tend to be slightly more flamboyant than the stuff we get down south. But it does give you a feel for the, the, the reason that we notice these chaps. These are probably the, the most observable of the water bugs that you get. It's the adult stage of the damselflies, which is the line through the middle, or the dragonflies, which are the more ro robust um, cruciform sort of looking wings um, that you see top and bottom in this in this um, illustration. Dragonflies um, are, as I've said before, and we'll say lots of times in this particular talk, um, basically, yeah, just little packets of food for platypus. But that doesn't mean that they don't do a whole bunch of stuff in their own right. This is a bit of footage that my friend Tom Sloan took of a damselfly that we came to know as sorry, dragonfly that we came to know as Green Death, simply because she was an amazing performer on film. And she probably meant the end or ceased the lives of about um, 50 or 60 different types of invertebrate while we had her in a tank. And then one day emerged and, and flew off and, and never said thank you once. But she was an amazing dragonfly. And I guess the cool thing that um, Green Death demonstrates here is, is the sorts of mechanisms that these tiny, tiny little beasts that you wouldn't really see much of normally, they can be amazingly complex. So this, this a uh, jaw underneath Green Death's um, mouth there gives her the ability to strike a prey at a prey animal from about half a body's length away. And that's a that's a, an amazing thing that, well, most prey items don't see it coming for, for one. Um, are we all good? Is there a my question or a issue or are we we're good? It's just a microphone. That's cool. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I'll leave that would be. Um, Dragonflies and damselflies are probably, I've, I've got them in this um, talk fairly early on in the piece because they're probably one of the larger little protein snacks that platypus will come across. Platypus will eat the whole range of water bugs, but dragonflies and damselflies are sort of, the, they're only animals that really get to about the size of your little finger, I guess. Is, and, and as a result, they're probably one of, the, one of the animals that a platypus really, really, really enjoys getting hold of. Um, they are uh, predators. So they'll inflict death and destruction on all of the smaller water bugs, you know, beneath them in the food chain. Um, but they're also mindful of the fact that, you know, even the largest water bug can be chomped up by a fish or a platypus. And so you'll notice the chap on the right there, which is a telephleb, um, is all covered in spikes and spines and stuff. And that's probably a slightly naive attempt to um, uh, protect it from uh, predation from fish and things like platypus. Um, having seen these things in cheek pouch samples, I know for a fact it doesn't necessarily work. Um, also in gut contents from fish. So it doesn't really matter how spiky you are. If you're tasty enough, people will have a go anyway. Um, dragonflies do have one cool secret weapon. However, they are actually jet propelled. So when they're running away from stuff, I think you'll notice, notice, may have noticed in that platypus video, a lot of things were undulating a bit like dolphins and trying to sort of swim their way away from the, the impending doom that is the platypus. But uh, dragonflies, when they get um, uh, spruced by something like a platypus or a fish, can actually 
jet propel themselves away by shooting water out of their anus. Um, and they can do this because they breathe through gills that are actually in their anal cavity. And um, so that uh, breathing by sucking the water into that cavity, then removing the oxygen. If you do that really fast and under pressure, you can um, jet away from impending doom, which is kind of cool. Probably the um, next, maybe not the largest, but probably the next most conspicuous of the insect um, food items on a platypus's agenda is something like this. This is a stonefly. And we'll talk about stoneflies again, because these chaps tend to be really good indicators of water quality. Um, if you're getting lots and lots of different stoneflies, particularly these guys who go by the common name of fluffy bums, um, for obvious reasons. Um, they've got a fluffy bum, for if you've missed that. And this pom-pom here is actually a gill structure. And what they're doing with the shaking and stuff is getting deoxygenated water away from those gills and then getting uh, nice oxygenated water back into the body so that they can breathe properly. This gives them a really distinctive movement, which is one of the things that we use um, to help us identify them if you're using the water bug app, which is something I'll flog a little bit later on in this thing. Um, I've got that on loop, so I can actually just move on. When they're not moving quite so fast, they look a little bit like this. This chap in the top left of this screen is a thing we call spiky Rigapurla in common name. And they're quite a charismatic beastie. These things are mostly um, herbivorous or gungivorous, I guess. They're eating a bunch of things like fungi, bacteria, um, all the sorts of things that mean that the, the bits of leaf and uh, bark matter that fall into a river start to fall apart. The, the microorganisms that are responsible for that decay are a very, very nutritious sort of food source. And a whole bunch of the water bugs that we're looking at in this talk um, key into that food source. Um, stoneflies are not an exception. The things on the right there are basically um, a very low budget form of adult um, life that stoneflies engage in. They don't really go through any metamorphosis of um, amazing length. They basically just gaffer tape a couple of wings on and then walk out of the river. And you can see that the, the, the body form is, is very, very, very similar between the uh, stonefly larva or nymph, they tend to be called when they go through this, this cycle, and the adult. And their ability to fly is often very similar too. Like they fly just as well underwater as above. Um, the wings are almost there just to show, to demonstrate that they're insects. Um, Something that's a little bit better when it comes to flying and is probably well known by any of you chaps in the audience that are fly fishers of any type, uh, these things. This is a, a, a set of pictures of Leptophlebeard may, of Leptophlebeard mayflies. Um, you can see that all of the things in the photos here have three tails, um, whereas the previous chap had two tails. So stoneflies tend to have two tails, mayflies tend to have three tails. That's one of the things you can use to separate them. It's less true of the adults. There's a whole bunch of mayfly adults that have two tails or one tail just to make life difficult for you. But once you're underwater, and as long as you're in temperate Australia, actually even tropical Australia, yeah, um, the three tails mayfly, two tails stonefly thing works quite well. Mayflies are predominantly sort of uh, the sorts of beasties that are key into that layer of gunge that we were talking about before. Um, and as a result, they tend to get eaten by a lot of other things. They're quite a diverse group. There's about five or six families um, Australia-wide, um, and they do have sort of subtle differences. Um, the leptophlebeards that we had on this slide are all very flat and sort of, you can see from the bottom left thing there, that it has a very sort of almost like a huntsman spider's amount of flatness to its body. And in contrast, the baiteds in the top left of this thing here, if you were to um, look at them from front on, they're, they're They've got more like the posture of a dog or, um, you know, a more upright and squished from the sides kind of an animal. Um, the fellow on the top right there is a, a canid mayfly. They're one of the mayflies that, despite being an, usually being an indicator of good water quality, there's a couple of examples that can tolerate things like um, high levels of uh, siltation and stuff in rivers. And the, the reason these chaps can do that is if you look at that top um, right uh, picture there, you can see that uh, normally the gill structures, which on the um, on the baited up here, if you can see that little little discs there, they're what it breathes through. You can imagine if, if you had a whole bunch of silt dropped on top of this animal, they would um, pretty rapidly be put out of action. And so canids do this thing where um, they have a little cover over the top, and that's what this thing here is. And all the gills are safely nestled in underneath that protective cover. And so that gives them a little bit of tolerance of um, you know silt when it's passing through a system. The adult mayflies down the bottom here, there's baiteds, a male and a female on the left there, and the canid on the right there. 
Um, that's just so you've got a, a vague idea of what they look like. I have to admit to not being very good at identifying the adults. I tend to restrict myself to things that are in the water. When I'm IDing these sorts of things, one of the, the things I like to do is to, um, how do I undo that? Do -do -do -do. Pointer options. Click. There we go. So one of the things that um, so this is that flat sort of huntsman looking sort of a chap. That's a leptus the beard mayfly. The way these critters move is often really really distinctive, and we find that you know even without um, getting you to count the number of legs and how many hairy bits it has on its um, behind its eyeballs, and that sort of level of micro um, analysis to actually do an ID on a critter, you can actually do quite a lot of really good identification just looking at the movement of these things. And so that's one of the, the sets of characters that we use quite regularly if you're using the water bug app to ID these things. Um, I'll, I'll change the, the screen quickly before you all go spare with all those things running around. But um, it does give you a feel, I hope. For, for how the movement is actually quite an important thing with these animals. Um, one of the coolest things about mayflies is, well, apart from their diversity and all that sort of stuff, is the way that they are awesome indicators of how, how horrible we've been to the streams that they live in. Mayflies are basically totally and utterly allergic to human beings, as far as I can tell. Um, this little bit of map here shows you a green dot for a site where someone went and they found a mayfly and a red dot for where they went and they couldn't find any mayflies, but they found plenty of little red wriggly things. So that means they went there looking for aquatic invertebrates. And you can see that all around Melbourne, pretty much where the mapped um, urban fringe is, you have green dots um, often uh, upstream of the, um, of the gray. And then once you get into this urban stuff, you'll lose those mayflies quite quickly. And this is often due to a whole bunch of things like urbanization does wicked, horrible things to rivers, but um, the mayflies respond to this quite, quite quickly. And you'll notice in, the, in this particular side, there's lots of that sort of stuff happening out in the Western suburbs there too. So it's, it's one of those things, but they are very much um, a, a good indicator for um, what's happening in these systems. Um, in Hobart, uh, we've, we've done a whole bunch of surveys where we'll walk up and down rivers and um, you'll get these lovely lines in some instances where the stormwater comes in and, and that will be like a five meter band where you have mayflies on the upstream end and no mayflies on the downstream end, simply because of the introduction of um, urban stormwater. And if you've ever, ever, um, as, a, as I think probably the, the best example of this that I've ever come across in my life that, that, that really nailed down for me why that would happen was um, I used to have a dog called Munro and she was very much a water dog. And she loved when we walked up the, the river just dunking at regular intervals. And um, when we lived near Pottery Creek, which is an urban uh, Herbert River, um, over the five years I had her and walked her there, she smelt on various days of uh, almost pure turpentine, uh, engine oil, human feces, um, you, you name it, she pretty much got dunked in it at some stage. And that gives you a feel for the sort of stuff that is moving down, not all the time, but in pulses through these urban stormwater drains. They are absolutely hideous things, mainly because human beings don't, don't know that they are connected the same the way that they are. So I, I have friends that um, I quite regularly chastise for doing things like um, tipping the uh, waste engine oil from their cars when they do an oil change into the stormwater because it's a horrid thing to do because it goes straight into your nearby river. But that's that's I guess that gives you a feel for why these um, lines happen because these things are quite horridly toxic um, and and the sorts of things involved are many and numerous at the moment and include everything up to like pharmaceuticals and, and what have you. So the reasons for these abrupt cutoffs in rivers are myriad, I guess. Um, and it's, it's worth going to have a bit of a look in, in an urban river if you're interested in these sorts of distributions because the patterns are beautifully obvious. This pattern that we've seen in mayflies, um, freshwater ecologists have been looking at similar things in the whole range of freshwater taxa, I guess. And as a result, they've done this thing where, um, you know, if you take, take a life's work and you, you, you look at um, what little animals do in a river and you, you uh, work on their ecology endlessly, um, you can bet your bottom dollar that someone will have come along and taken all that beautiful, complicated, erudite work and they will have simplified it to a number between one and 10. And so, yes, we have done that with water bugs. And one of the coolest things, I guess, about being so such a horrible oversimplifier of things is it does mean that we can now, um, by looking at creeks, um, pretty much anywhere in Australia um, these days, 
by looking at the assemblage or the fauna of critters that you get there, you can tell whether it's in good nick or not by the critters that you find, or possibly more importantly, by the critters that you don't find, I guess, because they've died from the various things. So in this particular diagram, I can sort of give you a feel for the, the way we, as freshwater ecologists that do these sorts of ecological assessments, this is kind of the way we think of our beasties. Um, in the top left of this diagram, we've got um, the stoneflies that we talked about before. Um, I'm going to zoom in on him there. That's that middle fellow in the middle there um, with the two tails and the pom-pom on the end. And we've got some mayflies also, which are the chaps with three tails around that. And top left, the thing with all the dangly bits off its side is a megalopteran or a toe biter. And they tend to only occur in lovely sort of, you know, uh, cascading bouldery sort of streams with um, lots and lots of oxygen in them and, and um, yeah, beautiful sweets of all sorts of other water bugs to eat or bite the heads off because toe biters are actually quite predatory. As you can sort of tell from the body, body form of that thing, it's, it's obviously built for terrorizing things, killing them and biting their heads off. Um, a whole set of other invertebrates exist also in these wonderful sites, but their tolerance, I guess is the best way to describe it, of unpleasantness um, can be said to be higher. And so things like um, these riverine maggots in the middle there, water mites, worms, some of the beetles, some of the back swimmers, that sort of stuff, will tolerate water quality drops. And, and, and as a result, they, in the system where we've got this 10 to 1 thing, will score something closer to a 1. The reason we've given things these 1 to 10 scores is that, that the simplest way you can assess a stream is to get all of the critters you've found then average their scores. And the average score that you get for the critters, you assign to the place that you're testing. And that gives you a score between one and 10, effectively. It's never 10 and it's very rarely one. Um, that tells you a little bit about the health of the river that you're in. The system uh, that uh, uses this best in, in Australia is, is referred to as the signal systems, S-I-G-N-A-L. And um, we've modified it a bit for the citizen science stuff that we do, and we call it a signalt with a T on the end. Um, all of that can be explained in the, the methodology type stuff that, that um, is attached to that method if you want to head down that path. Um, it's uh, all related to that water bag ID stuff that we're talking about. Um, amongst the critters that are sensitive, so up that 10 end of the spectrum, I've, um, we've pointed at um, stoneflies and we've had a bit of a look at mayflies and they're both indicators of good water quality. We talked a bit about uh, dragonflies and damselflies and they tend to hang out more in the middle. So their gill systems are better put together and they can, can handle a little bit of impact. But one of the other critters that is an indicator of good water quality but also features apparently really, really, really heavily in uh, platypus diets, just to link it back in so that I um, get paid at the end of this, um, are the caddisflies. And caddisflies are one of my favorite water bugs. And they're my favorite water bug because they're so incredibly diverse. So within the, the order Trichoptera, which is the caddisflies, um, they have a whole bunch of different body forms. They can have uh, critters like the fellow at the top right there, which is a hunter caddis. You can see his front legs have been modified into shears or scissors for chopping chunks out of prey items. Um, and compared, to, um, he, he has no case, so he's a, a caseless or a free living caddis. But many of the caddis are kind of more famous, I guess, for, for doing this thing where they build a little protective case that'll go around their body. You can see from this diagram on the left there that they're very much the same body plan. And all that you've got is um, the big abdominal hooks, which are sort of like grappling hooks for grabbing onto stuff and, and helping you move around in the stream. In the case of cased caddises, that's always, it, it, no, always say that, the case, case of cased caddises, um, that large hook at the back gets reduced into a small thing like this, which is, I guess, more like a Velcro hook. And that hooks into the silken lining on the inside of each of the cases. The tiny, tiny fellow, um, you don't get a good feel for the size here. Um, the uh, chap in the bottom photo there is, is probably about the size of two pinheads, maybe three pinheads put together. Whereas the chap um, in the top there, the hunter caddis is probably, that's in an ice cube tray. So you can see the size of the square. Um, so it's, it's considerably larger than the micro caddis as they're called down the bottom there. Um, they give you a good feel, I guess, of the range of, of beasties there. There are also a whole bunch of quite specialised and awesome caddisflies um, uh, that, that you can find in rivers. This particular one is called a, a net spinning caddis, and the, the structure at the bottom right of this slide is the amazingly intricate uh, mesh that these chaps uh, spin, and it catches detritus and small animals, and they'll clean the net at regular intervals. They spend their time living in the little lean-to. You can see this sort of grotty... 
um, structure just to the left of the net there. Um, and that would be where this fellow at the top would live and spend his days um, just popping out whenever some nice tasty bit of grot gets caught in the net and then cleaning and, and meticulously repairing that because often the bits of grot that come through are bigger than the net and they'll get smashed up. These things, um, once they've matured, pupate, and then they turn into a moth-like thing. Um, fly fishermen go nuts over these things because they, uh, they, uh, they mate in huge sort of swarms that bob up and down over the top of the water. And it drives trout nuts because every now and then one of the females will dodge down and try to lay eggs in the water. And um, they, they love going a mouthful of them there. And so they're quite a, a, a great thing to make flies uh, imitate. They've got interesting color patterns. They're a little bit hairy at one end. So they're just a perfect thing to try and imitate with a, a tuft of chicken um, and a, a nasty big hook. So they're yeah one of the darlings of the, the trout fishing world. Um, they're also, I guess, one of the simpler body plans for the, um, the, the caddis flies. Um, actually, that's not true. They're all fairly simple body plans, but we're probably one of the simpler structures that they build. Um, some of the structures can be actually beautifully um, ornate. This is a uh, Ocetus, which is a predatory caddis from sort of slow flowing areas. Um, this is definitely in your part of the world. Um, it's all through Victoria in various stages. It tends to hang out in the sandy, silty parts of pools um, and races around. Um, once again, like many of these invertebrates, biting the heads off other smaller invertebrates. You can see from the mandibles on this thing, which are just there in front of the eyeball, that um, it's, it's quite well kitted out for that sort of thing and is a fast moving sort of a predator. One of the coolest things about this particular genus, Ocetus, is that it comes in sort of different uh, case styles too. This is, in the background there, is a, a, a what we call a log cabin caddis, and it's the same genus entirely. Once again, it has those huge mandibles and is quite obviously likely to be a predator of you know, some critters. And it does this cool thing where rather than having a sand grain case where each of the grains of sand is stuck together meticulously with a little um, thread of gluey silk sort of exudate from the, um, just underneath the mouth parts. Um, it actually chops lengths of weed and puts them together in a log cabiny sort of structure like this. Um, I've also dropped in Canota placata, which is a species we call the shingle caddis in Tassie, because it has the same technique, but it uses a totally different structure. And you can see that little case there is made out of shingles. And this is what gives this caddis the name, the shingle caddis. And they're stuck together the same way, but it meticulously crafts them into a sort of a 3D structure so that there's a slight curve in the overall length of the case. Um, but then I guess once the animal is hunkered down and um, eating the surface out of the leaves, and you can see it's been chewing on the leaf that it's sitting on there. But this case does this beautiful thing where it protects its head entirely. So it, it looks for all the world like its surroundings. And it, um, yeah, is, is, is much less open to predation because it's got its entire body sort of covered over. So these structures are amazing. And caddisflies sort of once they've run the course, tend to pop out looking something like a moth, but with enormous mouth parts. You can see in that bottom photo there, the labyrinth is absolutely ridiculous on these guys. The word trichoptera um, translates roughly as hairy winged. And you'll notice in a lot of these shots that they have um, uh, uh, a thing that I suffer from where you have a hairy back and they all of the hairs come out of the shirt, that sort of thing. Um, the caddisfly equivalent, they're extremely hairy geezers. Um, they, the transition from that larval stage, which is for, for all intents and purpose, purposes, quite a simplified maggot body with um, a sclerotized front end into something that's a, quite an amazingly complicated um, flying contraption, all takes place um, through a, a, pupate, a pupating phase, um, which is one of the two options when you're an insect in a river. Half of the critters tend to go this larval life cycle, which is on the left here, and others will go the nymphal life cycle. So the mayflies, stoneflies, dragonflies, all of those ones that we looked at earlier, they do this thing where when they grow, as they eat things, all they'll do is they will um, pop down their back, um, shuffle off the old skin, and then a slightly larger um, version will emerge from inside with you know soft skin so that it, it can expand to fill the, the next size up. And each time it does that on its way to adulthood, um, these critters will increase the size of what's called the wing buds. And you can see that uh, the middle photo on the right-hand row there is a water boatman, and it's got those lovely little triangles, which are the beginnings of the wing buds on this animal. The final stage, which is sexually mature, has a fully formed wing pop out of that. Um, we'll get to see more of that in a, in a minute. Um, in contrast, the larval life cycle, you end up with a sort of very, very simple um, body form, often maggot-like like this, or caddisfly-like, or beetle-like, and then the animal goes through a pupil phase. You will have come across pupae um, in various things. They, they look a little bit like um, 
Egyptian mummies. Um, you, you're not familiar with that sort of system they had with Egyptian mummies where the sarcophagus, which is the exterior casing, would have all of what was inside drawn on the outside, but it was um, immobile and was just sort of a, a clunking great container for the insides. Pupia are a little bit like that. They have all of the fascinating insides drawn on the outside, the wings, the antennae, all the bits that move and fl help with flight are all picked out in amazing detail on the outside of that pupil case, but are totally useless at this phase. And then once the thing emerges, the um, amazing flying machine is, is what you end up with at the bottom of that. Um, emergence is possibly one of the most painful looking um, things to go through that I've ever seen. This is a caddisfly emerging from the side of a rock. And you can see it's dragged itself out of the water, split down the back, and then is now pumping its thorax full of all its blood so that it can squeeze out of the old skin. It's also at this stage shedding the insides of all of its breathing um, apparatus. So uh, many of the aquatic insects do this thing where they have uh, tracheal lines that go inside their body. You can see them, the little white tangly bits just underneath the animal there. They're the insides of its lungs effectively and it sheds the interior of those as well. Lungs in a very loose sense of the word, they're actually just holes into the animal that allow air in. But um, yeah, it does look like it's a fairly comprehensive little setup. And then once they're at this stage, the wings will dry. And once they're fully crunchy, they can take off and fly into, usually into the riparian zone where they'll um, breed, reproduce, and then come back and lay eggs in the water. And that pattern is, is pretty much solid for damselflies, mayflies, uh, dragonflies, stoneflies, any of the sort of more uh, traditionally insecty looking critters. And I guess that highlights something I'll, I'll bang on about a bit later in this talk, and that is the importance of not just habitats in stream, um, but if you want these critters to persist and to be there to provide, you know, uh, an amazing smorgasbord for your platypus, you also need to have a reasonable amount of habitat on the sides of a river so that um, the adult stage of many of these insects is catered for and they can reproduce successfully and, um, yeah, get uh, offspring back into the river. Um, this is a simulid. It's probably one of the more tolerant critters. Um, what it's doing in this particular talk, I guess, is just representing that it's not just amazing things with legs that all look very, very similar. I find that stoneflies, mayflies, and dragonflies, they all have a very similar look about them, have a, a very, very distinctive body plan that they all, all sort of adhere to. But the world of freshwater invertebrates is actually, you know, quite, quite diverse. And, and it, it, it has amongst it things like the mayfly that you just saw then, that was baited and this simulid or black fly larvae. And it is about as alien as you can get. It has a bunch of little hooks on the posterior end and a, a silk secreting gland at the front end. And once it's found a spot for eating, it, it um, unfurls these amazing antennae that are like uh, big moose antlers that it uses for filtering the food um, from the water as it passes past. So the, the body forms on these critters are actually quite drastically different critter to critter. This is a an amphipod or what well, isn't currently but it will be in a second that that's an amphipod there um these chaps are a crustacean so they don't do the thing where they um, emerge and fly off they'll be in the in the river for their entire life but i put them in there i guess to give you that feel once again for the diversity of the body form in these things in our rivers in tasmania um in many spots those amphipods will be one of the dominant life forms. And they will basically spend their time shredding all the leaf litter that comes into the river into smaller and smaller pieces and, and eating it as it decomposes and, and processing it. And I think in Hobart River Lake, many of the platypus, one of the main uh, food items that are turning up in their um, cheek patches is, is um, amphipods. To identify many of these things, um, I can point you at this thing. It's um, an app we put together. Uh, it's, it's worth having a muck about with. Um, most of the levels that we identify that I've used when I'm talking about bugs in, in this thing are, are, are identified through this app. Um, the coolest thing about this though, is that it actually allows you to enter data as a citizen scientist that can then be mapped and give you an idea for you know whether bits of your creek are naked or not. Um, and the next bit of the talk, I'd like to just uh, dwell on that assessing streams thing just for a little while, if I may. Um, this is the results from a little water bug blitz that we did, I guess, um, on that river that I was talking about that um, Munro and my old dog used to get um, all sorts of unpleasantness in. And just to talk you through this map, 
uh, the sea is on the right hand side, the mountains on the left hand side. And Tassie does this beautiful thing where our um, things are awesome to things are horrible um, trajectory all happens very, very, very rapidly because we have basically got national parks and town and then the city all in the space of about you know, 10, 15 kilometers. So the river goes from being wonderful to being horrible in, in a really, really, really brief amount of time. In contrast, many of your rivers in Victoria are much more long sprawling things that have a bigger run. And so the degradation happens over a longer length of time. In this particular one, we started down near the river and you can see the little arrow there says that we've got four taxa, which isn't a hell of a lot. And using that signal system, we ended up with 1.5 um, of the, uh, in the, the, the signal score. Um, by the time we got to the top, we got many more taxa and a much better score. You'll notice that some of these arrows that I've got in this, this are red and some are green. The red green split is whether or not there were mayflies there. And you can see just around where it says Lena Valley Road, um, which is just around the corner from where I used to live, um, there's this amazing thing. And you can walk, you know, 10 meters up the stream this way, and there'll be mayflies, and 10 meters down the stream that way, and there's none. And it all happens basically where the stormwater becomes unpleasant enough to sort of change things. When you use the app, uh, it does this thing where it summarizes things, I guess, like this. This is the site from way down the bottom of. Uh, uh, Newtown Rivulet, where we were. And this is what happened at the top. So you can see instantly that there's a, a difference in diversity, all sorts of different critters. And that sort of all gets spat out as a number using this sort of a thing. Um, you know, these are, this is just serving suggestions, but those numbers that tell you how tolerant a critter is are on the right of these boxes. So an eight's a good scoring animal, we'll let the mayflies there. And something like a, a worm tends to score more like a two. And as a result, if you've only got four critters and they're all low scoring, you end up with a signal score, which is quite low. It's a very, very simple, simple system. And it's basically using this pattern that I showed you before. These critters are useful in many ways. Like one is to, to give you a feel for, you know, the, the overall ecological health, I guess, of the system. But each of them has a bunch of things that they like to have in life. And it's not just necessarily good water quality. In some instances, it's actually having very, very distinct bits of river to be in. So I mentioned earlier that they, the toe biters, top left of this screen, um, like, like big boulders and fast flowing cold water. That's entirely true. And so if you're finding them, you've probably got that sort of habitat around. Um, in contrast, the little amphipods, which we've also looked at here, prefer like, you know, big piles of rotting leaves and lots of detritus. They still like a lot of cold water and fast flowing water, but that's um, one of the things that's important to them. You can see in this thing, I've, I've just picked out a few of the things that these critters need. And if you're standing next to a river, that basically looks a little bit like this. These are the places that these water bugs will live. And interestingly, when you watch a platypus go over a reach like this, they will go through all of these different habitats looking for the critters that are there. And these critters, which add up to give you that signal score of six, all come from very, very different spots. So if you're doing a biodiversity sort of a survey of this kind of area, it's, it's worth looking into all those different spots. And when we do the surveys for the um, National Water Bug Blitz, we try and get what's called a, a biodiversity list from these sites. And so you're trying to get your critters out of all the different habitats that are there. Um, so how does that work in a, this is obviously a very nice site. Um, and you can see if you get into deeper, darker, horribler, urban sort of sites, this is our Hobart Rivulet just before it runs under town. <clears throat> You're dealing with a very different and much, much simpler kind of ecosystem. All of that suite of critters that you could have in a river basically gets whittled down to probably maybe one or two critters and even they probably have a hard time of it on occasion. Like when this floods, it's gonna hose things out to sea. You're much more likely, I guess, on the fringes. Well, you chaps are, are not necessarily as deep urban as this. And so in, in some of those more fringy habitats, you end up with this thing where you do have quite a number of different sites and a number of different habitats, sorry, within the site. Um, and so lots of things are catered for, but often things like the water quality, if you've got lots of surrounding um, agricultural stuff, will bring scores down a little bit because you'll end up with, yes, there's lots of lovely places to live, but every now and then the water quality is a bit hideous. And so therefore the critters score less. And so you'll end up with something like this. I've flogged it a couple of times previously. If you were to want to do this sort of thing, the water bug app is definitely worth having a squeeze at. It is available on uh, iOS or the Apple um, operating system for phones, but also on Android. Um, we didn't run with Windows. I'm not even sure if they still exist. And so I think we might have backed or failed it, 
no, not back to loser there, which is different to backing a winner. The cool thing about the water bug app is not only that it helps you to identify books, so it's a bit like a, a bug ID guide. Oh, I should say again, it's, it's totally and utterly free. So yeah, that, that has two things going for it. One, well, two things that are attached to it. One is that it means you can get it instantly and it's downloadable and free. The bad side to that is that there's no money associated with it. So when we have bugs, they tend to, or sorry, errors, you might use the word term bugs when you've got an app that deals with bugs because it gets confusing when you're talking to the IT guys. But it means when we have things that need fixing, it takes us a little bit longer to get our um, ducks lined up. Currently, um, the release that's in there works fairly well on most phones. Every now and then, a new release of um, the Apple operating system will make things go belly up. But currently, it seems to be doing quite well. Once you submit data from the Waterbug app, we have an online database through waterbugblitz.org.au, which allows you to map those things. And the other cool thing that the Waterbug Blitz um, stuff does is it, it uses a whole bunch of government-derived data sets, which are then simplified so that they are in exactly the same format as they would be if you took them. Um, and that allows you to go to a site that you haven't been to before. And if you can find a dot on one of these maps, um, it'll give you all the historical data for whether or not what the bugs were doing over time historically that's ever been taken in that area. Well, whatever, but you know, what's available. Um, that looks in your neck of the woods, a little bit like this. And you can see that there's quite a few there. And you've got some nice little reference sites that there that are popping in in green in the upper reaches. And, you know, as you go into town, the oranges and reds um, tend to predominate a little bit. But um, which, which puts you in a good spot. So you've got all sorts of rivers in your area that you can have a look at. And the other thing about this, I guess, is there's all sorts of rivers in there that aren't being monitored. And so if you're around the corner from one of those, um, it would be lovely to get some extra dots on the map if you're that way inclined. Um, I think I've banged on enough. Um, so what I'll do is I'll um, finish this talk up with um, an example of uh, an instance that I'm kind of fond of, which is where water bugs actually get the better of vertebrates. Generally speaking, it's the other way around, but in this particular instance, oh, no, that's not right. In this particular instance, go. Um, this is a water tiger, the, um, the larval stage of a diving beetle, and they are horrific, terrible predators. Not got very good eyes, but they can feel a lot in water currents and stuff. And their mandibles, which you can see it using to great effect here, um, pierce prey and then pump them full of digestive fluids. Um, there's a shrimp very wisely staying out of the way just on the side there. Um, and once the, the digestive fluids have gone in and you know, turned the insides of the prey item into soup, these guys reverse the pump that's in their head. And rather than pumping um, digestive juices into the prey item, they suck the soup back out. And you can see it going bilio um, to pump the juices back into the um, water tiger's body there. And um, I, I, I guess this is my, um, it's not all um, in favor of vertebrates. Um, sometimes, in favor of vertebrates, sorry. Sometimes the invertebrates have their own um, winning days. Um, that's probably the end of my ramble. Um, I'll give you a black screen and stop sharing. And let's see if anybody had any questions. Oh, got heaps. What's the best way of um, doing these questions? I, I can read and read them. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I just realized I was on mute. I was supposed to be reading the questions, oh. but I didn't turn mute off. So if you don't turn mute off, you can't read the questions. Uh, so, thanks for that, John. That was a really inspirational um, talk and uh, on an area that I'm learning quickly about and my traditional knowledge base hasn't really covered so um yeah i found it very interesting and and the water the water blitz um sort of strategy and that community engagement and citizen science stuff empowering sort of local people to to get involved in in um you know environmental related things is is really awesome so and um yeah it's it's as i said before it's not something that i've really had a lot to do with but sort of inspired me to get a bit more involved in that space and sort of traditionally a bit of a terrestrial character, but um, <laughs> but Melbourne water is obviously water related. So um, <laughs> I've only been here a bit over two weeks, but um, yeah, so getting getting a bit into the hydrological scene, um, which has been good. But yeah, so I'll read a few questions out. Um, I've got two so far in the chat. Uh, this is from Elva. 
Is there any relationship between case moths and caddis flies outside of being insects? Case styles in the moths are also as varied and interesting due to design and material. Also, do you find aquatic moth larvae or larva? Sorry, question mark. Cool. So um, I guess there's, there's a couple of answers in there. Yes, you do find aquatic moth larva. I'll work them backwards because I'm contrary like that. Um, and there's, there's sort of two different body forms to that too. There's ones that live in riffles in sort of uh, probably northern Victoria up. And they tend to do this thing where they'll build these cool little silk tunnels over the top of a rock and then run around underneath them, not having their heads bitten off. Um, and then when they stick their heads out from under this awning, they chew down on the, 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 the brown fuzz that's on the rocks there and then disappear under the awning again, which isn't a particularly caterpillary way of life. The other ones that we get are often in wetlands and what have you, and they'll make a case very much like a caddis fly. So once again, you're, you're absolutely right, the way you've pegged that, that similarity between the, two, between the two critters. And evolutionarily, they're thought to be very close. So the Trichoptera and the Lepidoptera share a common ancestor when you look at fossils and what have you. So it's, it's very much the same, the same sets of genes. It's bizarre that they have a behavioral similarity as well as all the morphological ones. Um, and you do find that the cases are, are very, very similar. I like to refer to case moths, the caterpillars, as land caddis, and that gives terrestrial entomologists um, the shits a bit. But um, I, I think it's it's every bit as legitimate as, as the reverse. Um, let's do another one. All right. So this is a question from Richard from uh, Nillamick Council. How many life cycles would a water bug complete in a season? Depends on your critter. So um, little, uh, say you were to grab a, a bucket of water and carelessly leave it outside and you didn't get mosquitoes, um, you just got red wrigglery type things in the bottom or bloodworms, they can rattle off pretty much one a month almost. So that's a really rapid life cycle. In contrast, things like your dragonfly larvae will, will, um, will probably take a year, sometimes even two in um, alpine areas and stuff like that to get there to go through from egg to um, breeding adult. So it's, it's, it's very variable, but um, it, generally and on average is is this lovely seasonal sort of a thing so we can do this thing where we head out in spring and most things are at about the right size that you can look at them because most things are sort of annual um yeah so it's 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 variable but we we take advantage of some of the um the averages in that setup and uh another question from richard uh sorry if i missed this do water boatmen and back swimmers fly as adults they absolutely do. Um, and they were the scourge of plein air dining up in Shepparton for a while there. You know, um, that stage of dining where people had the enormous white plates um, with very small <laughs> amounts of food in the middle. Apparently the UV reflectance on it is exactly like a little puddle of water. And you'd be eating outside um, uh, near the river up there. And you'd have these things coming in at 100k an hour and bouncing off your, um, your plate, making awesome noises. Um, but yes, they're very mobile, very, very... <laughs> Very good flyers. Um, and, and all they're doing, I guess, at that stage is, I don't, I don't think they like to do it all the time, but they definitely do it to disperse. So once your, your puddles start to dry up in the landscape and you've got to get out and get to somewhere better, they get take to the wing and, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go um, quite large distances. So they're, they're very competent flyers, both of them. Awesome. Can I ask you a question, John? Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Why is it that um, fish... People that scientists scientists that catch fish have to record what fish they catch into a database, mm. but bug people don't, because we're missing out on all that data. And do you think we'll ever have to? Um, I think it comes down to ethics mm -hmm. because water bugs don't have souls. Might have been yeah, the they don't have rights. <laughs> We've got no rights. They've, no, yeah. that's it. Um, so it's, it's frustrating it, because it's frustrating. And, like, I, and it is weird because we have, um, it's not like we haven't got a, uh, a shared taxonomy, so it would be easy enough to watermark. Do you know what I mean? Like the, yeah. the, the Atlas of Living Australia has this beautiful thing where it smooths stuff out. Um, all of our data, you know, is compatible with that. Um, yeah. All the stuff you probably collect is compatible with that too. Um, don't know? No. Okay. Human beings. Gah. Just looking at your map oh. and just going, I probably have data on those rivers. But What are you doing? Sit down and like swear at my app for an evening um oh, look I, I, I still use this oh that's yeah we've got to update that um yeah 
and then I'll have <laughs> no it's well used cool thanks Kyla <laughs> I've got we've got another question from Elva mm -hmm. uh, do platypus eat cicadas another similarity between water tigers and ant lions including compound eyes um, mm -hmm. so I am seeing so many similarities and love the land caddis reference Cool. If that, if that can take off, I've, my work here is done. Um, I've, I'm not sure that, so trout fishermen do this thing where because they're trout fishermen, they're allowed to kill the things that they catch and therefore gut them. And so there's all sorts of incidents of lots of terrestrial insects that have been sampled in trout. Um, killing and gutting platypus is frowned upon, um, which I'm, I'm okay with. I think that's a totally reasonable stance, um, but it means that we haven't got all that in that large amount of information and to, to see when something happens infrequently you need a lot of data i guess and so there's nothing that puts terrestrial insects into the um into the platypus diet it's, it's not in any of the studies i've seen there's a there's a bunch from the shoalhaver system there's a bunch from victoria and there's a couple from tassie and there's nothing terrestrial getting in there which is interesting because i reckon when you get those huge flights of insects, like you're saying with cicadas, similarly with gum leaf beetles, they all fall in. I'd be very surprised if your platypus, um, you know, refused to eat them. Um, they're, they're very much little shoveling machines. Um, and when you watch them foraging, like in that first video, you can see that they're putting a lot of effort into eating it. And they would not turn aside an extra mouthful, I don't think, if it just happened, just because it was a slightly drier mouthful. Um, and I guess the... Um, yeah, the similarity between water tigers and ant lions is 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 very very true. Um, they're all very simple larval things though, and they tend to all look the all look the same. Um, unfortunately, like just most of the things that go through a larval stage and are predatory, there, there's only really one set of body forms you can do it with, like squidgy um, garbage bag style body for expanding once you've eaten things, and then like a nasty aggressive. Um, positively medieval front end for killing and dispatching things. So they do <laughs> tend to all look much the same because they're doing the same job, yeah. Um, there are actually uh, ant -y type things in water. So that same group of animals has got aquatic representatives too. So, and they look much the same as well. They don't dig um, conical sh structures in the water though, because it's not possible because of physics. Uh, we've got a question from Warren. Um, what kind of areas do water boatmen live in? slow flowing generally so um wetlands are awesome uh disused swimming pools are awesome um dams those sorts of things because they are sort of propelled like a little boat they've got all these wonderful swimming hairs on the ends of their legs that make their legs paddle like in the way they get through the water and you can't really do that in a strong uh strongly flowing environment because you end up you know disappearing off into the distance um so they like those slow flowing environments um, oh. Still with open water, like they don't like a, 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 a water weed choked dam. They like something with lots of open areas to, to get about in. That's good to know. I took some notes on that one. Um, cool. uh, and Sandra has asked, what reference do you use to identify water, sorry, to identify aquatic invertebrates? Yep. That could almost be um, uh, like one of my that might be me logged on as something else asking a question so that I get to, but you've already held up the water bug book. Um, I, I tend to use, so the options are you can do uh, the, the type of ID that we have on the app, which is, I like because it does this thing where some things you can look at and you can identify them to species just the way bird, birdos do. So bird, bird spotters tend to have this thing where they're, they're in a luxurious space taxonomically where most of the things you can see and identify as a bird spotter are species. And that's really nice. With invertebrates, you tend to have to go up the taxonomic tree a little bit. And sometimes, you know, the best you can say is, I don't know, it's a worm. And that's that's all you've got. You know, even if you spend hours with a microscope, you might come out of the end of that hours with a microscope and a worm and still say at the end of that, um, it's a worm, which is unrewarding. Um, and so what we tend to do with the way we do the idea is we'll, we'll leave worms at worm and you can put your time into distinguishing some of the mayflies perhaps. And so Atelophlebia, one of the genera within the leptophlebeid mayflies, you can identify because it's got these wonderful gills that look like uh, Christmas tinsel down the sides of its abdomen. And it sort of fluffles them around in a, a very distinctive way. Um, so those sorts of things um, we have in the app and I, I, I like the way that works. Um, if you want to do formal consistent genus and species level ID, you've basically got to invest in about $200 worth of um, 
you're shaking your head, Carly. You've already invested. Yep. <laughs> Um, of, of different bits of literature that are all variously out of date um, and, you know, difficult to get hold of. Um, so that's that's one of the options. If you are interested in going down that pathway, I can probably bounce you at the references, but it takes a little while to get them all together um, and accumulated. Uh, if you're after a paper version, uh, the Waterbug book is still available, available through CSIRO. Um, that's the one that Kylie's got up there. Um, the other uh, thing that you can use is the 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 paper version of the app exists too, because I'm a bit of a Luddite. Um, I, I refuse to use the app when I'm in the field. I actually printed out the app, if that doesn't sound, that does sound really dumb actually now I've said it out loud, but I have a printed out version of the app sort of that I use. Um, and you can download that from the waterbugblitz.org.au website. It's called the ALT keys. And it, it has all of the differences between the animals there in a paper version. So you can print it out at Officeworks and flip through it to your heart's content. Um, and it's, you know, the same same stuff but in a paper format um and i'd recommend that i guess it's kind of cool because it's free as well so free is good app is free paper version is free until you print it out the printing costs a fair bit so if you um work in an office environment and it could be legitimately considered something you could print out at work do that <laughs> Thank you. Cool. That there. That's the awesome. Um, you well, might hand um, it over to yep. Richard. Yep. 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 So if there's no more questions there. Um, I'd just like to really thank John for his time um, and, and not just delivering a really informative um, presentation tonight with lots of information, but a really entertaining one as well. So it's been a pleasure um, to have you with us tonight, John. And I'd also, it made me reflect, I'm, I've, I've been learning a lot about soil and the soil food web and the, and the complexity of life and the predation and all of that sort of stuff that happens within the soil, which is often an unseen um, habitat and full of biodiversity itself. And I was sort of relating to that to my my knowledge been expanded about what's actually even happening within a simple um, mm. water system as well, and so it, it really just shows the complexity of life on Earth and how important it is to to look after all of these different um, systems that we've 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 got humming along, um, supporting us as we go. So um, a really big thanks to John uh, for being with us tonight, and also for Dom for helping with the questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is a very high chance that we'll be um, um, deferring the um, platypus celebration that we were going to hold on um, Sunday at Edenvale um, till later in the year, probably in spring. So keep an eye out for that if you were planning to come along. Um, but we still do have um, the webinars that are going to be, the recordings, if you've missed them, are going to be put up on our websites. And there is also the, um, the 4K, I think it is, um, um, bike ride with 10 decals explaining the life and life cycle of the, the platypus along the Diamond Creek. So if you've got your bikes and your kids, um, go out for a ride, start at Endale and, and um, go up towards Endale, Ellendale Road and come back again and learn a bit more about the platypus on Diamond Creek. So thank you very much everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and um, yeah, hope you have a, a good night for the rest of the night. And thanks, John. Pleasure, thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, Richard. Cheers.